So here we go. Okay. So today we're going to be talking about uh, dog food, obviously. Um, and I always like to say right up front, I'm no expert. This is just my observations on dog food over the past 27 years. It's really interesting because Okay, so way back in 1996, I was attacked by a dog named Scar. Looked just like this dog. <laughs> and uh, what I ended up is in, I ended up in the um, my apartment for about a week, and I really couldn't do anything because I was trying to recover from this dog attack. And this is right at the beginning of my career, and I just opened up my business in 1995. This was 1996. This dog, Scar, attacked me really bad. I'm laying in my apartment, this little dingy apartment in the basement in Fall River. And uh, I'm sitting there thinking, maybe I didn't make the right career choice. Maybe uh, dog training isn't for me. But um, as I was thinking about it, I was I had a lot of time on my hands. And at the time, I had this little Sheltie. Her name was Sam. If you go onto YouTube and look at some of my old videos, you can see Sam. And you can see a much younger me. But um, Sam was a great little Sheltie. He helped me for a lot of years. And right around 1996, she was a couple years old. And all of a sudden she started developing this really bad skin problem. And she could not, like, we could not fix this problem. She would stay up at night, chewing on her skin and scratching. And she would chew so bad, she would start bleeding. That's how bad it got. And it was really upsetting. And since I had this week off of recovering, since I had a week to recover, I started doing a lot of research. I was thinking, how could I help this little dog? Because I had already been to a bunch of different experts and they had put her on cold tar shampoos. They had given her steroid injections. We had done um, cortisone shots. We had done everything and nothing was really working on this poor little dog. So I had some time. And again, this was before the internet. Well, the internet was just coming on the scene, 1996. But um, I ended up going to the library and I was doing some research and there's Sam right there. That's my little dog. This is way back in 1996. And I was thinking, could it be her diet? Now, again, this is 20 something years ago and um, people didn't talk about diet the way they do today. But I was thinking, could it be her diet? And I was told nothing to do with her diet. Just forget about that. This is a problem that we have to fix externally and just stick to you know the, either the steroids, the baths the cortisone shots, but as I said, none of it was working. So I went to the library and I found, I found this book right here, The Holistic Guide for a Healthy Dog by Wendy Bollard. And I know this was in 1996 because this book, I still have signed by Wendy Bollard because once I found this book, I found that she was doing a seminar in upstate New York. So what I did with my friend Paula, who's also in the picture right here, that's Paula. She's holding my daughter. I don't know what's going on with my daughter's face there. <laughs> but uh, Paula and I, she's a good friend of mine. She's a groomer over in uh, Tiverton. But Paula and I went up to upstate New York and we went to a seminar here given by Wendy Volard. And Wendy changed everything for me. She said that the skin problems that your dog has absolutely has to do with the dog's diet. Once you change the dog's diet, you'll start seeing a big change in your dog. She says that skin problems are usually the first sign that there's something internally going on with your dog that you need to fix. And so I made the change in my dog's diet and I made the change in my dog's diet. How come it doesn't work down here? So I made the change in my dog's diet and her skin cleared up and she lived a nice, long, healthy 18 years. And it was, it was really nice. So that kind of changed everything for me. And that's when I really started to question a lot of things. And I really started to look into dog food. And if there's one thing that I've learned over the last couple of years, it's that people are becoming very sensitive to anything, any kind of topic, very sensitive. And so I don't really even like talking about dog food with people. I pretty much stick just to dog training. And even just in the dog training world, I get into trouble 
because everybody's so sensitive and people are easily triggered nowadays. And if you've ever done any training with me, you know that I'm not an all positive trainer. There's positive training out there. And from experience, all positive training will only get you so far. At some point, you have to add in a correction. And so because training is such a sensitive topic and corrections and punishment such a sensitive topic, it tends to get me in some hot water once in a while. So that's why I don't even go into the dog food area because I am not an expert. I don't claim to be an expert. And everything that I share tonight is just my observations. And this is why I ask you to have an open mind. If you disagree with me, it's okay. It's, you know, um, you can disagree with me. You can agree with me. You can question me. It's, it's really okay because, as I said, the last thing I want to do is upset people. But every topic seems to get people mad. So nowadays, how do you move this forward? Yeah, this thing keeps changing on me. So I have to try and figure out as we're going along. So um, this is how sensitive people are nowadays. This is just kind of a funny, quick aside. Um, this is Vito Perone. If you haven't heard about this guy, this is how sensitive people are. This guy was fired as the superintendent of the East Hampton schools because he wrote an email to the school board that said, dear ladies. And everybody that was on the school board was a woman. But the word ladies was considered a microaggression and he was fired. Right. That's kind of the society that we live in nowadays, which is why I always kind of stay away from any kind of topic that's going to upset people. But I get questioned all the time about dog food. So that's why I decided to do this. And I just want to like said, just give you a couple of examples of how sensitive people are. This is Tim Noakes, in case yeah. you've never seen him. This is Tim Noakes. And Tim Noakes is a professor and a scientist and a doctor over in uh, South Africa. And he almost had his medical license suspended permanently because he wrote a 27 word tweet. And that 27 word tweet was just simply advising a mother to wean her child onto low carbohydrate, high fat foods. Again, which is okay to disagree with, but this basically was saying that low carbohydrate, high fat foods is what mother's breast milk is. It's low carbohydrate, it's high fat, it's practically all cholesterol and protein. But because he made this statement on Twitter, he was almost um, almost had his medical license revoked permanently. Again, that's just to show you how sensitive the world is. And me, I'm a dog trainer. I've been in business for th almost 30 years. I got four books on Amazon, voted best dog trainer, animal control, a bunch of reviews, got a lot of happy dog owners. But again, I don't claim to be an expert on dog nutrition or dog food. So this is my official disclaimer right here. You can read through that and then sign at the bottom. Just kidding. There's nothing to sign, but you can read through that. And then what I want to do is start talking about nutrition and how interesting nutrition is. Because if you think about human nutrition, think of all the different diets that we're told are supposed to be the healthiest diets for us. And these are some of the most popular ones right now. You have everyone saying, that I think right now everybody's pushing a vegetarian vegan diet. That's what it seems like the most popular human diet is right now. That's what we're all told to do is to eat less meat and to go more vegetarian. But you also have people out there who say you should eat carnivore. There's some people that say you should eat paleo. Some people say you should eat keto. Then some people say you should follow the, the uh, government food pyramid, right? The standard food pyramid. And again, if you go to the experts, which would be the doctors, it's all over the place. And this is how I kind of feel about dog food. It's a very confusing subject because there's so many different opinions. If you talk to this doctor, this is Dr. Dean Ornish, who's a very popular doctor, a lot of best-selling books, big YouTube channel. This guy, is, he basically thinks that you should eat no animal products, high carbs, not very fat foods, that you should eat just plant-based foods, okay? So that's his, his advice on dog food. If you go to this guy, this is Sean Baker. <laughs> this guy thinks you should just eat meat. That's it. No fruits, no vegetables, just meat, eggs, not even nuts, just meat. He's a carnivore doctor and he's a doctor too. If you go to this doctor, this doctor's 
says that we should all eat a paleo diet, that we should just eat meat, nuts, fruits, meats, lean meats, fish. Sounds reasonable. If, if you go to this guy, he says you should eat a ketogenic diet. This guy should eat an animal-based diet. You could go on and on and on. So that's what I find with most people in dog food right now is that it's very confusing and they don't really know who to listen to. So when it comes to food, if you expect the government to help you out, you're going to also get confused because this is how crazy the government is right now. The government, if you look at this, this right here, you'll see that there's avocado and frosted flakes. So I bet you everybody on this call would agree avocado is healthier than frosted flakes. I also think everybody on this webinar would agree that salmon is healthier than SpaghettiOs. We all would agree with that, but your government does not agree. You see, your government thinks that frosted flakes are healthier than avocados. And you probably think I'm crazy, but if you watch this quick video, this video is from the Wall Street Journal. This will tell you where the government is when it comes to nutrition. A car slammed on their brakes in front of us. We Oops. crashed into the freeway wall. Gotta wait for the ad. I Sorry. Well, I know there's an ad there. From a small human error, eliminating that will make it a lot safer. Most of the vision is to make autonomous vehicles a safe and accessible reality. We have a chance to make a difference. You prepare a salad for your family and add in an avocado. Is that a healthy ingredient? No. You're feeling a little sluggish at work and decide to snack on some almonds. Is that a healthy choice? No. These surprising answers are in line with the Food and Drug Administration's current definition of healthy when it comes to food. That's about to change. At the urging of food companies and lawmakers, the agency plans to update its definition of healthy for the first time in two decades. Back then, it defined healthy based on five criteria. Fat, saturated fat, sodium, cholesterol, and beneficial nutrients like vitamin C, or calcium per ounce. So while a one ounce avocado is a delicious food and generally thought to be healthy, 0.5 grams of fat per serving put it in the unhealthy category because it exceeds the FDA's three grams per serving threshold. Oh, and those almonds? 14 grams of fat per ounce. Well, at least for now, they're not on the healthy list. Many consider Kellogg's frosted flakes to be great, but are they healthy? The FDA says yes. And that's because it has zero grams of fat per serving and meets FDA requirements of being low in sodium, cholesterol, and contains beneficial ingredients. But what about its 10 grams of sugar per serving? It doesn't matter because sugar content wasn't on the FDA's or nutritionist radar in the mid 90s when the FDA defined healthy. Calls for the FDA to make changes got a jump start after it slapped a fruit and nut bar maker kind company with a warning last year ordering it to remove the word healthy from labels on four of its products because of saturated fat content. The agency rescinded that order for kind last month. Any changes the FDA makes to its general definition of healthy would likely take years to implement after rounds of proposals in hearings. So until then, how well do you know your healthy food, at least based on FDA rules? Does salmon whet your appetite? Unhealthy, thanks to 11 grams of fat per three ounce serving. How about SpaghettiOs with calcium? Eat up. They make the cut with just one gram of fat per serving. And how about low-fat Pop-Tarts? Also FDA-friendly, clocking in at three fat grams and one saturated fat gram per serving. Kind of crazy, right? And that's that's the government telling you that those foods are healthier than natural foods, right? It's just crazy. Um, if you look at Lucky Charms, this is a very popular food. Obviously, everybody knows what Lucky Charms are. Um, look what they have in it. Yellow 6 and red number 40. Yellow 6 causes adrenal tumors in animals, maybe contaminated with cancer-causing chemicals, occasionally causes high, severe hypersensitivity reactions. Red number 40, banned in the, UK, in the UK and Switzerland, associated with decreased concentration in children and linked to hyperactivity. Think about what every, most kids eat before they go to school, right? They eat this kind of stuff. And then they wonder why, oh, how come these kids are misbehaving? So food has a direct effect on your dog's behavior. So you may be wondering, why would the government and the food companies promote the use of these cheap grains and chemicals? But it's very simple because we all know that it's for the money, right? Billions of dollars are spent to convince you to feed your dog 
their brand of food. And there's so much dog food, so many different brands to choose from. It's, I think, an $82 billion industry right now, the dog food industry. And they spend a lot of money to get you to buy their food. So one of the things that you see recently was the whole thing about grains. I don't know if you've come across this, but grain-free food became very popular about two, three years ago. And then right after grain-free foods came out, you started seeing all these studies about how excluding grains from your dog's diet was actually unhealthy for your dogs. And so it was interesting to me because me personally, I don't think your dog needs to eat grains. I really don't. That's just me personally. See, and I thought it was interesting that the FDA did an investigation into the potential link between certain diets and canine dilated chiromopathy. Why did that study come out all of a sudden? It's because they thought they wanted to prove that grains a grain-free diet was unhealthy for your dog. And you may be wondering, how did they do this? And this is a great website. If you've never checked it out, it's called Food Politics. It's by Marion Nessel. She's written a bunch, bunch of books, not just on dog food, but also she dives deep into how um, food is such a mess because there's so much money involved in food. But she found that all the studies that were done were funded in part by the Nestle Purina Pet Care um, Company and the Barclay Fund. So isn't it interesting that Nestle was per, um, funding this study on grain-free pet foods? And if you uh, down here, Dr. Freeman was who, the one who did the study. And in the last three years, Dr. Freeman has received research funding from, given sponsored lectures for, provided professional services to... Hills Purina and Nestle Purina Pet Care. So for me, that seems a little suspicious that Nestle would be funding the study on grains in dog foods. And you may be wondering why did they want to push grains so much? And it's kind of funny. This is why I don't I don't think dogs really need grains because I've never seen a dog salivate when they see a cornfield or a wheat field, right? I always see dogs walk right past all the grains, right? They go right for the meat. But they want to push grains because grains are a cheap source of food. Carbohydrates are inexpensive. Protein is expensive. So they like to fill up the dog food with a lot of grain. Corn, cornmeal, corn middlings, wheat middlings, the, uh, all the stuff that we don't consume goes right to the dog food company. So when they take that cob, and they take all the kernels off the cob, that cob gets sent to the dog food companies, along with all the other parts of the grains that we don't eat. So that's why you'll see a lot of grains in dog food. It's very cheap filler, much cheaper than meat. So when it comes to dog food, this is one guy that I studied for a long time. This is the guy that I kind of follow. His name is Dr. Ian Billinghurst. He's a veterinarian in Australia, and he did a lot of studying, and he always asked, you know, what would a dog eat in the wild? And that's what made sense to me. If I thought about my dog getting loose and living in the woods, how would she eat? Would she go for the cornfields around here, the wheat fields? Would she eat the hostas like the deer do in my front yard? No, she would hunt for raccoons woodchucks, squirrels. That's what you would try to survive on. And that's what Dr. Billinghurst really did was he studied their ancestral diet. And he really dug into the question of are dogs carnivores or are they omnivores? Because that question comes up a lot. Does my dog need grains or does my dog need vegetables? <clears throat> and so he did a lot of studies on wolves because wolves, the timber wolf is uh, directly the dogs evolved directly from the tim timber wolf around 15,000 years ago. So that's what he studied. And he came up with that carnivores definitely have larger stomachs than plant eaters, which dogs do. They have a higher concentration of stomach acid for faster digestion. Dogs definitely do. If you look at it, herbivore, it takes a long time for them to digest. And I think they have two or three stomachs. 
They have stronger acid, kills the disease causing bacteria. Uh, shorter digestive tract, so it passes through faster. Where plant eaters have an unusually long digestive tract. Dogs don't. So <clears throat> he came up with the seven pillars of nutrition. And these are the seven pillars that he teaches. And the first thing for him is protein. The dog needs a really good source of protein, then fat, and then carbohydrates. If you look at most of the dog foods out there today, they you'll see carbohydrates are usually one, and then protein, and then fat. But he believes that a food should have good source of protein, good source of uh, fat. Carbohydrates shouldn't come from grains. They should come from vegetables. And then, of course, vin vitamins, minerals, water, and air. That all has to be clean in order for the dog to have superior health. <clears throat> and some things that we kind of overlook sometimes is the dog's um, vitamins and minerals that are in the food. Because a lot of the food, which we'll talk about in just a second, a lot of food is processed and it's designed for that bag to sit on the shelf. In order for that bag to sit on the shelf for six, nine, 12 months, there's going to be a lot of the nutrition that's been cooked out of it because it needs to sit there. It needs to be preserved. So that's where some dog food, you know, the um, dog food that's sitting on the shelf for a while isn't always the healthiest for your dog. You may want to supplement. So, yeah, so he always wants you to look at the macronutrients, the carbs. What, what's the carb source? What's the proteins and what's the fats? Those are the macronutrients. And then the vitamins and minerals are a big deal inside the dog food because that could also affect your dog's health. As I said, if the dog food has been cooked and processed, a lot of the vitamins and minerals are gone. So one of the things that you have to do is you really have to get good at reading the labels on dog food because that'll give you what you need. Again, this is a question that I get from everybody is what food, what brand of food do you recommend, Eric? And I don't really recommend any food. What I recommend is that you study the dog food labels. You look at the food labels and see, is this the best for my dog? And there are some good foods out there. There's some really good foods out there. Um, I'll tell you what I eat. I feed Sky in a few minutes. But when you're looking at the label, the first two ingredients should be a protein. If you can, you want to find a dog food with the first three ingredients of pro protein. That can be a little tricky sometimes, but that's really what you want to look for. You also want to look at the fat source. You want to look at what they're using for carbs. And you want to look at how the food is preserved. Because the preservatives they use in food can be not only shocking, but sometimes even dangerous for your dog. So this is something that you want to look at when you're studying your dog food labels. Now, when it comes to protein, when you look at the, the label on the dog food bag, they get creative with how they mention the protein because you'll see chicken you'll see chicken meal and you'll see chicken bry product and you may be sitting there going well what's the difference so if you look at chicken chicken is 70 percent water and only 12 percent protein so not exactly the greatest source of protein for your dog chicken meal is 65 to 75 percent meat protein five times more meat protein than the plain chicken. So that's what you really want to look for. They're just using the chicken meat. And then the chicken byproduct, that's when they use any part of the slaughtered chicken. So the, when you see chicken byproduct, it could be the feet, it could be the feathers, it could be the beak, it could be any part of the chicken. So that's why you have to really pay attention to what they're labeling, how they're labeling it on uh, the dog food bags. Fats are interesting when it comes to your dog food because you'll have animal fats and then you have what they like to call heart healthy vegetable oils. And the interesting thing is that when you see the words heart healthy vegetable oils, you can be convinced that it is not heart healthy vegetable oils. It is not even a vegetable oil. Vegetable oils are seed oils. They're made from seeds. They're not made from vegetables. Corn is not a vegetable. It's a grain, cottonseed, soybean, canola, palm, sunflower. Those are all seeds, but they call them vegetable oils and they've labeled them heart healthy vegetable oils. I think the seed oils are some of the most dangerous things for your dogs and humans. And you really want to avoid any kind of seed oil or limit the amount of seed oils that you see in your dog's food. Much better if the food is preserved with an animal fat. 
lard, tallow, anything like that. But yeah, this is how cottonseed oil is made. It is highly processed, at extremely high temperatures, and it is not healthy for you or your dog. Actually, seed oils were used originally as any other oil for machines to keep the machines lubricated. And then they figured out, hey, wait a minute. If we have people eat these seed oils, we can move a lot more of them. And so they started transitioning seed oils into the food. And it's kind of been a disaster ever since because seed oils are very, very unhealthy. And, and again, this is something you don't have to take my word for it. You should just look into seed oils. I just think it's funny how they keep calling them vegetable oils. And they don't even just call them vegetable oils. They call them heart healthy vegetable oils. <laughs> so stay away from the vegetable oils. Um, the carbohydrates on the dog food. You always want to take a look at the carbohydrates, see what they're using. As I said, much better to use vegetables than grains. So if you think of a human... When it comes to grains, I would say out of all the grains, rice and oats, probably the easiest grain for us to digest, probably the same with your dog. So if I was going to use a grain with my dogs, that's what I would probably use, rice or oats. I definitely wouldn't use corn or wheat. Very difficult to digest. And a dog's digestive tract is much shorter than ours. So dogs can have a really difficult time when they have a diet that's high in corn and wheat. Better to go with the carbohydrate that's a vegetable. Again, vitamins and uh, released nutrients provide energy for your dog. And at temperatures over 118 degrees, the vitamins are destroyed. So this is where you want to start thinking about, at least I think about, supplements when it comes to my dog's food. I do supplement with different things in my dog food because if I'm feeding the dog a a food that's in a bag, as I said, that's designed to sit on that shelf for a year, I know that that is not going to be the most nutrient-dense food for my dog. So this is where I would supplement the food to make sure they're getting all their nutritional needs. And uh, it's easy. There, there's all different types of uh, places that you can get vitamins and minerals, uh, powders to put on your dog, different ones that you can find. Same thing with minerals. Between 30 to 80% are lost during the food processing. So again, you want to look at a vitamin mineral mix supplement for your dog. And then of course, um, I am a big fan of making sure that my dog gets probiotics. So when it comes to probiotics, most people don't think of that. And if, and if you go back, if you go back uh, just a couple of years, 10 years, nobody really talked about probiotics that much. Now, Seems like the whole world's talking about probiotics. Interesting, in one of my emails that I wrote not too long ago, is that if you give your dog an antibiotic, which a lot of dogs get for different reasons, you have to understand that that antibiotic is going to wipe out all the good bacteria in your dog. So if your dog needs an antibiotic for whatever happened to him, you put him on those antibiotics and all that good bacteria is gone. And what we don't get told is that once you're done with the antibiotics, is that you should start giving the dog probiotics. You have to replace that good bacteria because the antibiotics will wipe out the good and the bad, okay? So it's very important that you give your dog probiotics. And there's different ways that you can do that, <clears throat> which we'll go over in just a few minutes. Um, here's a big thing that you want to look for in dog food. You want to look for different types of preservatives and additives that they put in. Big one is the BHAs. BHA is really bad for your dog. Um, and, if, and if you study BHA, you'll see that it does a job on your dog's kidney and liver and can irritate their skin and eyes. It's also a known carcinogen. So again, someone comes to me and they say, oh yeah, my dog can't stop scratching. First thing I want to do is see the food. And if there's BHA, get that dog off that food immediately. Uh, artificial food coloring. So the really interesting, blue number two, red number 40, yellow number five and six, all linked to hyperactivity and extreme allergic reactions to the food. So I see some dogs that come in to the training school and these dogs just can't contain themselves. They can't sit still. They're bouncing, bouncing, pacing all over the place. Again, I like to see what the dog is eating. Is the dog this hyper because of the food 
that the poor dog is getting, right? And and uh, a lot of these red number forty, I think yellow number five, they don't use them in other countries. Banned, can't can't even. They have to change. I know there's certain foods like uh, ketchup, and I think some Campbell soup brands, they have to change the recipe when they send it to a place like England, because you can't. The food that they put on our shelves can't be sold in the food on the shelves in the food uh, for the food in England and some other countries. Why do they do that? Corn syrup, definitely want to make sure that you don't have corn syrup in your dog's food. Nitrates and nitrates linked to cancer, okay? A um, lot of different things like that that you have to be careful of. So the best thing to do is look for a natural preservative. Natural preservatives like vitamin C, vitamin E, you can find them in... Um, the words topical and ascorbate. Uh, they also use chicken fat to preserve different dog foods. So that's the thing to look for. You definitely want to be careful of anything that says BHA, BHT, ethoxyquin. Ethoxyquin is nasty. It's a really nasty preservative. I don't even think they can use it on humans anymore in the United States, but they're still using it in dog food. So if you see ethoxyquin, definitely a food you want to stay away from. MSG. <clears throat> MSG is used in a lot of different foods and again, not a good preservative and it comes up in all these different names and that's what they do a lot of times on the labels is they come up with different names to trick you so that you don't know that it's actually in your dog's food. Um, natural flavors, you'll see that not just in dog food, you also see it in human food. Natural flavor could be anything, could be MSG. So if you're trying to avoid those types of things, you really have to pay attention to the dog food labels and what they're feeding. Okay. Now, this is this is a uh this is Hills metabolic chicken flavored dog food. And this is a popular dog food. And what I want you to do is I want you to look at the ingredients on this and tell me, do you think this is a good food for your dog? So let's take a look. The first ingredient, whole grain wheat. Hmm. I don't think that's a very good food. Uh, let's see. Whole grain corn. Chicken meal. Powdered cellulose. Soybean meal. Corn gluten meal. Dried bee pulp. Dried tomato. <laughs> Hydrolyzed chicken flavor, right? Chicken fat, okay. Flaxseed, right? But if you look at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Almost the first seven ingredients are uh, grains. And just think of a dog trying to digest all that grain. Is that really a nutrition, nutritional, um, is that really going to take care of all the dog's nutritional needs? I don't think so. And then wonder why dogs come up with all these different problems that they have. <clears throat> if you look at the health of dogs today, again, starting to go down. Because dogs have diabetes, dogs have skin problems, dogs have cancer, all these problems. And maybe it's linked to what we're feeding them. So pedigree, everybody knows what pedigree is. I think everybody knows what pedigree is. This is number 15 on Amazon. So this is one of the top selling brands on Amazon. Look at the first ingredient in, in pedigree, ground whole grain corn. Oof. Second one, chicken byproduct, not so good, right? And then corn gluten meal, again, not the greatest. Uh, and then you keep going down, grain, ground whole grain wheat, natural flavor. Wonder what the natural flavor is. Is it MSG? Could be. Then you keep going down, there's a bunch of words. I don't even know what they are. But then you get to red number 40, yellow number six, blue number two, yellow number five. Yikes. This is not not a food that I would feed my dog. I'd be scared to feed my dog this food. And it's one of the most popular on Amazon. It even has great reviews. See for, it, see for yourself on Amazon, but not what I would consider a really, really good dog food. So this is why you just have to pay attention, learn how to read the dog food labels, know what to look for. Oh, look at this grilled steak flavor. I wonder what that's made out of. <laughs> but know what to look for so that you can make the right choice for your dog. Okay, now let's look at what I think is a really good dog food. This is Red Barn. 
First ingredient, beef. Second ingredient, lamb. Third ingredient, lamb meal. Beef meal, pork meal. Wow, first five ingredients. Protein, meat, right? Lentils, potatoes, garbanzo beans, peas, sunflower oil. It's the only thing that I don't really agree with is the sunflower oil. Sunflower oil, because that is a seed oil. So if Red Barn contacted me, which they won't, but if they contacted me, I would say, oh, let's change that sunflower oil. That's the only thing I really don't like when I see the ingredients on this food. I would rather see something like coconut oil, uh, aloe, anything like that. But overall, looks like a great food for a dog, right? And if you look down here, all kind of fermentation extracts, probiotics, right? Last couple ingredients, put some probiotics in there for your dog's gut health. So everybody asks me, hey, what do you feed Sky? What Sky is? This is my dog Sky. If you know, if you never met Sky, she's uh, she's about eight years old now. I got her when she was two. She's been a pretty healthy dog the whole time I've had her, but she's been eating really good ever since I had her and uh, still does all my classes with me. She's got a beautiful coat, high energy, uh, comes into all my classes, does all my demonstrations with me. And everybody wants to know, what do I feed her? And what I feed her is barf. <laughs> no, don't get upset. I feed her barf, which stands for bones and raw food. Um, and again, I didn't make that up. That's from Dr. B. Ilan. Dr. Ian Billinghurst, that's what he calls it. I think he changed it to biologically appropriate raw food now. Um, some people got upset with the acronym BARF, but it's basically what I feed her. And um, the interesting thing is that I feed Sky for about less than $500 a year. <laughs> I give her the best quality meat that I can get. And I really don't pay much than $500 a year. And everybody says, well, how do you do that? And the great thing about living where I live here in Westport, uh, you have Westport, you have parts of Tiverton, Little Compton, and there's a lot of woods, and there's a lot of deer, and there's a lot of geese, and there's a lot of fishing, because we're right on the ocean, in case anybody's watching, doesn't live in this area. And I have friends that are hunters and fishers, fishermen. And so what I do is I get the meat off of them, because some of my hunting friends, they don't eat venison. So my friends get fish that they don't eat. And I have a lot of friends, a couple of friends who hunt goose and they don't eat goose. So I take it for sky. Um, the food gets processed by at the butcher. And then when the food comes to me, we put it in the freezer and then we take the food out as it's needed. And we mix it with the things that you see on the left here. I do use leftovers in my dog's food. so. If we have some leftover chicken or broccoli or anything like that, we put it right into our food. I don't put in leftover pizza crust or anything like that, popcorn or anything, but I do put in leftovers. And if you're feeding your dog a dry kibble, it's actually an easy way to supplement your dog's food. You have a little leftover meat or vegetables, you can put them right into your dog's food. We, um, we use ground eggshells. Rachel grinds them all up. She puts some kelp, spirulina, alfalfa in them. We give her sweet potatoes, probiotics. I'll talk about that in just a second. I always put in some salmon oil. Whenever we have some aging fruit, apples, bananas, anything like that, we put it in. And I always make sure that I put in some lard or tallow into her food. And the reason I put the lard in, the fat, is because she eats a lot of deer meat. Deer meat is very lean, very lean. And your dog needs to have an appropriate amount of fat in their diet. I know everybody's kind of terrified of fat. Fat's been villainized over the years. Everybody's been told fat's bad for you. But um, again, if you start looking at some of the, the studies that are coming out now, and you start looking at some of these people that are eating keto and carnivore, uh, I'm not saying they're healthy, but some of them look pretty healthy and really comes down to what you feel comfortable with. But if you're going to feed your dog anything, if you're a hunter and you want to feed them Dear me, I really recommend that you increase the amount of fat that you put in your dog's food. Really important. Otherwise, dog could have health problems. So um, in our house, we make kefir. If you've never heard of kefir, kefir is a drinkable. They call it like a drinkable yogurt. It doesn't really taste like yogurt. It's definitely sour. It's definitely 
um, takes some getting used to, but um, kefir is made with these little grains right here. You ferment it overnight. And so I always give Sky a little bit of kefir in her food. And these grains, if you start making kefir, these grains start to multiply like crazy. So whenever we have extra grains, I put that in her food along with a little bit of kefir. Kefir is considered one of the best probiotics for humans on the planet. So that's why we make it every day. It's really easy to make. It takes 10 minutes to make it a day. And I'm not, again, you may not want to do that with your dog. But if you want to make kefir, I can give you some grains <laughs> because I got plenty. I feed them the sky. We have so many. Um, but it's just an easy probiotic. It's very, very healthy. It has more probiotics than uh, yogurt. So that's why I give her a little bit of kefir. Now, you may not want to make kefir, which I understand. And this is a really, really good supplement that you can use with your dog. It's a fermented superfood. It's called Gussie's Gut. And it's actually um, developed by Dr. Ian Billinghurst. Now, I want you to understand one thing. I, there, I don't have a link for you because I'm not selling it. I'm not even promoting it. I'm just presenting it to you. This I've looked into this. I'm going to start getting it for my dog. I'm going to start adding it. Even though I give her the key from, I'm still going to start adding this. Um, and again, you have to go look it up because I don't have a link for you. Because again, I'm not selling anything. This is strictly just information, but this is a really good product that'll help uh, your dog's gut health. So best advice is that when it comes to dog food or anything to do with your dog, you really need to do your own research and come up with your own answers. Honestly, the common question that I get all the time is, how do you feel about spay and neutering, right? I know I saw my friend Jim Helms on uh, the call here tonight. And uh, my friend Jim, that's a great guy to contact if you have questions about spaying or neutering, right? He'll, he'll, he'll give you some different alternatives when it comes to that. And again, I'm not anti-spay or neuter. I'm not pro-spay and neuter, right? It basically comes down to what's best for you and your dog. And that's why I always tell everybody, if you want my advice, I'll give you my opinion. And then you can take it from there. And you shouldn't take it as law. You should just take it as my opinion. And then you can take it from there. So that's what I always recommend when it comes to what's the best food for your dog or anything else. Okay. If you have any questions, can we take questions? Mm -hmm. if, yeah. if you have any questions, we can. Uh, can yeah, we can take a couple of questions. Uh, I have Rach here. She's going to put, um, oh yeah, I'll, before I forget, <laughs> before you leave, if you want to uh, vote for me, if I've ever helped you out with anything, if you've ever watched my videos, read my emails, come to me for training, read one of my books, if I've ever done anything to help you train your dog, if you wouldn't mind giving me a vote, okay, I'm uh, up right now for uh, best of the best South Coast, best dog trainer. Um, if you wouldn't mind giving me a vote, all you gotta do is click on that link and you can vote for me. I'd really appreciate it. Again, if I've helped you and, um, and if you have any questions, like I said, I can stay for a few more minutes and I can answer any questions. You can just, well, you just type them in, just type in the chat and I can, uh, been voting every day. Well, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Carlene Rodriguez. Thank you so much. I really do appreciate that. Appreciate that. Are there any other questions? about dog food or training or anything else. How do you feel about a good quality whole, oh, here we go. I feel about a whole good quality whole milk yogurt. Yeah, I, I think um, yogurt definitely is a really good probiotic for the dog, especially after they come off. The thing about dairy that you have to be careful with, especially with dogs, is you got to give your dog, you got to test your dog out a little bit. You don't want to, you don't want to dump a half a quart in your dog's food and, and then all of a sudden whoa what happened here give them a couple of spoonfuls and see if they can handle it because some dogs just like some people can handle dairy really well me i can handle dairy great i can whatever it is i can i can eat dairy what i can't eat is gluten I'm, if i eat a piece of bread i'm done so um so that's what you want to do okay so pumpkin yeah i i do use pumpkin um i i don't think sweet potato is better than pumpkin it's just when it comes to uh, sweet potatoes, my wife just puts a big batch in the oven and she cooks up a big batch. And then we do, that's what we do is we take the deer meat out, we take the sweet potatoes, we mix everything together, all the supplements. So it's just easier batch um, cooking the sweet potatoes. If the dog is having problems, then like uh, the dog's vomiting and things like that, then pumpkin's a great way to go. 
but um pumpkin's great so we've been voting for you every day too well thank you Alyssa. i really appreciate that i do i appreciate it so much um people refer to me all the time and they uh, vote for us and um we really do appreciate it. And that's why we like to do these things because so many people that support us out there and uh you know we can't thank you enough any other questions anything else i can answer for you okay so what i'm going to do is i'm going to put this up on a video so i'll let you know when it's available so that you can share it with your friends or you can um you can go back and re-watch anything and if you do have videos after you watch then you can oh sorry i didn't see these questions come in uh we give our dog a scrambled egg every day good or bad i think eggs are great for dogs i really do i mean i give my dogs eggs all the time um if i have leftover scrambled eggs or anything like that my daughter who's the who's not the biggest eater in the world i made her an omelet this morning <laughs> ham and cheese omelet it's kind of dad i am but i made her ham and cheese omelet she ate like half of it right she need all of it so i had a few bites and then i gave the rest to sky and her food so I'm a big fan of scrambled eggs. And I give my dogs eggs raw too. Um, what bone source do you use with raw foods? I thought bones were bad for dogs. GI yeah. So, okay. Great question, uh, Don. And it's a really good question. So when I give bones, uh, yeah, I didn't even talk about that much. I should have added that in a little bit more. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, when I when I give bones, what I do is I go straight to the butcher. You know, uh, right here we have Lee's Market. Um a couple, couple of weeks ago, I went to Amaral's in Fall River and uh, I, I asked for soup marrow bones and I give those to Sky, and she loves them, loves the soup marrow bones. And I give them raw. I don't cook them. I give them raw. And again, when you start talking about raw food, this is again where people start to get a little and you have to feel comfortable doing this with your dog. I'm not saying you have to give raw, but I don't give the dogs cooked bones either, because once you cook the bone, you're going to make it brittle. And that's where they can splinter. I've given Sky raw chicken bones, raw chicken bones, not cooking ch chick bones, <laughs> raw chicken bones. Cooked chicken bones would be a disaster. So, again, if you're going to give your dog a bone, if they've never had a bone before, then what you need to do is give it to them for a few minutes and see how it reacts to their digestive system. Here's the interesting thing about dog, uh, bones. Remember earlier we were talking about probiotics. What do what do dogs do when they get bones? A lot of dogs go and bury them. They bury them because as it's buried, they let it sit there for a few weeks and it starts to ferment, believe it or not. It starts to develop probiotics. That's what fermentation is. So uh, the Eskimos or up in Alaska, they the Inuits, sorry, I forgot. They they um they they take the fish and they they bury the fish for a couple of weeks and then they feed it to their dogs because they want the probiotics. So um yeah. We most we use eggshells. These are calcium source. Oh, calcium We're source. Nice. Uh, Rach uses eggshells. So whenever we whenever we make eggs, we got a big bowl. We put the eggshells in it and then she crushes them up and makes a powder with all the other stuff and then we add it into the dog's food. Okay. Uh, yeah. So what bones? So I thought, yeah. And again, that's why they think bones are bad for the GI um, is because it's either cooked or the dog's never had a bone before. Thank you, Lori Almeida. Thank you, Lori. I appreciate you coming on. Uh, Hillary, how you doing, Hillary? Haven't seen you in a while. Thoughts on dehydrated raw foods becoming far more. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think dehydrated raw food is great. And you are starting to see that becoming very popular. Um, who's Who's selling dehydrated raw food right now? I thought I saw it somewhere. Stella, Stella and Chewy, is that dehydrated? Yeah, Chewy, Chewy. Stella, Stella and... I, yeah, Stella. I'm not the, um, one of the things that I use for treats a lot is dehydrated liver. The Stewart's dehydrated liver, um, because it's one ingredient. If you look at most treats, dog treat bags, you look at the ingredients and you go, oh my gosh, why, why all these ingredients? We're dehydrated liver one ingredient so that's what we use at the dog training school is we use a lot of chicken liver a lot of beef liver salmon um it's all dehydrated so it's really good for your dog but um yeah and that's great i think dehydrated food is really good for the dog uh let's see renee on the grain subject i read that lack of grain inhibits the dog's ability to absorb parine leading the heart condition your thoughts yeah so that's that's i don't know if you were here for the first earlier part of this um webinar and if you weren't i'm going to put it up so that you can you can share it and watch it but um you go back to that study 
again, what I think is that does a dog really need grains to absorb? I mean, if your dog was in the wild, I don't really think they'd be getting grains. And the grains that a lot of dogs get in the wild or the vegetables, if again, back to Ian Billinghurst, what he noticed is that when a dog hunts and when they take down their prey, the first thing they do is they rip open the stomach contents and they eat the stomach. And that's where all the vegetables are. But all those vegetables are partially digested. So it's easier for the dog to absorb. And again, a lot of that um, is vegetables, not so much grains. So this is where, because um, again, if you think about a lot of animals, they're not really grain fed, they're grass fed, right? Most um, like like cows and steer, right? They eat grass. They don't really eat corn. They're forced. Yeah, same thing with deer, right? They're forced to eat corn or corn is like a last resort. So again, I am no expert. I can't tell you about the ability to absorb tar taurine or anything like that. But I've fed my dogs grain-free for years. And my dogs, you know, never had a problem. Never had a problem. But again, that's why I put the disclaimer at the front. I'm not an expert. Talk to your vet. Um, do your own research. I would question the research that's funded by a dog food company that wants to sell you a cheap grain source. But again, that's just me. Uh, how do you know how to feed? Figure out the calories. Yeah, I kind of look at her ribs. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I do. I look at her ribs. Uh, I pay attention to her stool. If she's really straining, she's not getting enough food. If she's um, really loose, she's getting too much food. Um, yeah. Uh, the funny thing is, is I was actually feeding her a little bit too much because, um, a couple months ago I, I said to Rach, I came home and I said, man, Sky had a little, she's starting to have a little bit of a difficult time getting into the truck. I was thinking maybe her hips were a little, little wonky, right? Cause she would hesitate right before she got in the truck. And then Rach said, I don't know. She's looking a little porky. <laughs> and what I've been doing is I've been, I think I gave her a little extra fat. Um, this is in the winter time. I was giving her some some lard and I was giving her some salmon oil and uh, we shaved a few pounds off her right in the truck. Right. It wasn't anything. It was just she had a few pounds that she had to lose. And on a dog, on a dog, you take you take three or four pounds off. It makes a big deal. Right. Big deal. So. Um, so, yeah. So you have to pay attention. And, and there's all kinds of charts that you can read online to um, to figure out what's how much to give your dog. But good question. Thank you, Michelle. Um, let's see. Beware, beware the cheaper foods as much of their meat is sourced from rendering plants, diseased animals. Yeah, I wrote about this. I wrote about this. Um, what was it the other day when I said, um, yeah, they use these. Yeah, they use roadkill and they use um, animals that have been euthanized. Yeah, what was it? Oh, Old Roy. Old Roy. One of the most popular foods because Old Roy it was sold in kibbles and bits, another popular food. It was sold at Walmart. And so and it was dirt cheap. And the reason it was dirt cheap was because the animals they were used, they would just do anything. And they were shipping horse meat to the old Roy plant where they made the food. And it was uh, animals that had been euthanized. So they were finding phenobarbital, which is what they inject into your dog when they put them to sleep. They were finding phenobarbital in the old Roy and the kibbles and bits. Can you imagine that? Your dog is actually eating a drug that is used to put them to sleep. So yeah, you definitely have to wear the uh, beware of the um, cheaper um, meat source. Absolutely, that's a really good point, Ralph. Thanks for sharing, uh, Renee. Thank you for this information. Thank you for attending. I appreciate it. Do you have a few other dry kibble brands that you recommend besides Red Barn? Have you heard of um, Farmina brand? Uh, I haven't heard of that. Um, one good website to check out is called dogfoodadvisor.com. So you can check out dogfoodadvisor.com. And what they do is they kind of go, they go through all the foods and they rate them on what they think is the best and the healthiest. So you can always check out that and that should be able to help you find, um, some different, uh, brands of food that you might be comfortable with. I haven't heard about the for me, for me now. I will take a look into it. And, um, again, it comes down to read that label. And a good a good guy to talk to is my friend Jim Helms. He runs Dog Pals. Dog Pals is a uh, dog facility in uh, Huntington, Mass. That's where he is, Huntington, Mass. He's a great guy, and he um, he's he really does a lot with nutrition. 
He does consults, someone to uh, call and check out. He can help you out with a lot of this stuff. Because again, I pretty much stick to the dog training. <laughs> but he really gets into the dog nutrition much more than I do. And I, and I don't really do consults on this or anything like that. So he's the guy to contact. Lisa, thank you. Great info. Thanks for attending. I really appreciate it. Renee, thank you. Uh, what did you do for dog on hotspots? Yeah, great question, right? I changed her food. That's all I did is I changed her food. It's funny, Sky, what was it, about two years ago? We went to... Uh, yeah, tea tree oil and coconut oil. Yeah, so about two years ago, we went... Um, we went away and she was being boarded at a kennel and it was a great kennel, great kennel. Um, but what they were doing is they were giving Sky uh, milk bones as treats. Sky will eat anything. She, milk bone? Yeah, I'll take it. Um, and so I think between the, the, the milk bones and the stress of the kennel, she came home, big old hot spot. And so, whoa, hot spot. Right. So the first thing I did is. I fasted her, right? I gave her 24 hours, no food. And um, that's where I gave her some her system some time to get rid of all that stuff. And then we started giving her tea tree oil and coconut as a topical, as a topical. And then uh, we got her right back on the good food. No grains, um, just good food. I increased her salmon oil, no chicken. Yeah, she seems to be really sensitive to chicken, but that's what I did. So, um, you know, if your dog ever gets hot spots, that's what um, that's what you can you can try. All right, like you can relate, Sky. <laughs> okay. Uh, so Renee says one extra pound on a dog, ten pounds to a human. Right? Exactly. And I think she put on like two pounds, so she was even twenty pounds around. <laughs> twenty extra pounds. Uh, let's see, Dawn. Thanks for all you do, Eric. You are right on in the training and dog food. My six-year-old German Shepherd. Swollen joints, severe skin issues after a rabies booster. Yeah. Vet said to avoid chicken. Yep, but that didn't work. A hand fed kibble and canned food because none of the German shepherds like their food after seven pages of things for skin issue. Doggy was diagnosed with severe allergies to dust mites, storage mites. Skin cleared up with raw chicken. Yep. Chicken leg quarters, nutritional yeast, raw eggs, shell, krill oil, probiotic, purified water, cottage cheese, yogurt. Yeah, look at that. That's some great stuff. <laughs> thanks for uh sharing do i recommend a grinder um so for the meat yeah most of the meat that i get is um it's uh, a lot of it's ground up like ground venison but uh some of it comes and we just chop it up hillary uh trying to speak small dogs after excessive research high kibble brands had great results with from brand yep grain-free mixed with dehydrated raw fresh food Good. So from you guys might want to check out from. Thanks. Uh, meat grinder. Let's see. Thanks. Sarah. Thank you for coming. There's a bunch of thank yous. Okay. Thanks so much for everybody for attending. And as I said, I'll put this up and don't forget if you can go ahead and give us a quick vote. I really appreciate it. And uh, I'll let you know next time we do one of these uh, webinars. Thanks so much. Have a nice night.